I'm Alexandra Harris, a senior editor and writer at the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Indian and co-author along with Dr. Mark Hirsch of Why We Serve Native Americans in the United States Armed Forces. We researched and created Why We Serve to introduce readers to the long history of American Indian, Alaska Native and Native Hawaiian service in the US military from the Revolutionary War to the present and to commemorate the creation of the National Native American Veterans Memorial on the museum's grounds in Washington, DC, which was completed in November, 2020. I welcome you to check out the museum's website where you can learn about the memorial, view our online exhibition, also titled Why We Serve, and explore our education lessons called Native Knowledge 360, where we take a deep dive into the history of Native American code talking with our uh, program called Native Words, Native Warriors. I'd like to recognize and thank any active duty service members and veterans joining us. I'd also like to acknowledge the Native people whose ancestral homelands were gathering here in the Washington DC area where I am and wherever you are, as well as the diverse Native communities who make their home here today. I'd also like to discuss today the broad history and diverse experiences of Native Americans, Alaska Natives, and Native Hawaiians during World War II in the Pacific. To provide a little background for that history, I'd like to first share a few of the goals we established for our publication and why that's important to us. First and foremost, we wanted to emphasize diversity not just in the wartime experiences of an individual Native service members, but in the diversity of the hundreds of Native cultures whose citizens participated in war on behalf of the United States. Often histories about Native people consider them from a federal policy standpoint or otherwise generalize an American Indian experience instead of taking a more humanistic perspective within a complicated narrative, which is what I, we felt we could offer. We wanted to elevate Native voices, especially women's, from the colonial era on, and in doing so, make their service more personal and accessible. The photos you see here are from Indians at Work, a post-Indian New Deal newsletter out of the Federal Indian Office that began in 1933 to promote Civilian Conservation Corps wage work, and then beginning around 1942, service in the military and was retitled, retitled Indians in the War. I found these images in three consecutive spreads in a uh, 1943 issue of the magazine, and they illustrated really well the three major stereotypes that affect Native service members. Examining stereotypes of Native service members was fundamental to understanding their experiences, as many of these stereotypes determined how they've been perceived by officers and peers, and thereby determined where they were placed in combat. And this is still the case today. In emphasizing the diversity of indigenous cultures, we also explored the many pre-European contact cultural approaches to war and being a warrior. Hundreds of tribes on the continent meant hundreds of worldviews and ways of structuring their societies. Motivations from for war differed from nation to nation. Some defended territory and didn't seek out war. Others sought out war, but not necessarily killing or death to raise their status within the community. So the idea of a monolithic so-called warrior tradition then, which is a term often used to characterize native service members, didn't exist in all native cultures. But for those where it did, the tradition can still be a motivating factor to join today. On that note, it's often assumed that participation in the military is motivated by, motivated by a single factor, patriotism. And the most repeated phrase regarding American Indian service members, that native people serve at a greater number per capita than any other ethnicity also assumes this on the surface. But when we look at motivations for, surface, for service on a deeper level, we find that patriotism toward the United States is often less of a motivating factor than the reasons most Americans join the military, to get an education, to see the world, to follow a tr family tradition, and as is common, to, to have a stable job or get out of an impoverished or abusive situation. But there is one ed 
added level of motivation unique to ind indigenous people, which is to defend their ancestral homelands. Today, we at NMAI hear this so often that it kind of seems cliche, but when you look back through time and the 250 plus years that Native people have been fighting alongside and in the US military, defending the right to live on their homelands is a constant. The indigenous traditions that mark a warrior, sacrifice, protecting the community and their way of life, the land and water, sovereignty or self-government still hold very strong today. And I wanna say a word about the phrase I mentioned a moment ago, because it had an impact on native participation in World War II and also on native people who serve today. The statement that native people serve at a higher rate in proportion to their population than any other ethnicity was likely true at some points during the 20th century, but it's difficult to prove with demographic data and does not seem to be true presently, even though this is difficult to determine. In a nutshell, it may be true, it might not. And that lack of clarity is very disrupting to a, a lot of native people who have grown up with this understanding and the anecdotal truth when they and a good portion of their relatives have served in the military in some capacity. The history of the phrase is convoluted. Cato Sells, who was the commissioner, commissioner of Indian Affairs during World War I, believed that enlisting native people in the military would further assimilate them as the militarized federal boarding schools were in the process of doing. Also, this would be an opportunity to prey on the tribe's customary willingness to sacrifice in the cause of war. Sells saw the war as a way to get tribes to further relinquish land to the government in the cause of patriotism. When I was unable to find any other origin for the phrase except for Sells, I was suspicious. It was then repeated during World War II by John Collier who succeeded Sells as the Commissioner of Indian Affairs. This kind of broad sweeping statement coming from the government during wartime made me wonder about motivations. Demographics for Native American service are themselves very difficult to target, though they demonstrate an enormous commitment. For example, numbers from World War II. Many historians have compared the number of people living on reservations who served, 24,000, with their total population at the time. And there isn't an agreement between the Census Bureau and the Bureau of Indian Affairs, who obviously managed Indian Affairs, of how many Native people existed in 1940. The BIA, or Bureau of Indian Affairs, estimated a total population of 394,280, quote, legal Indians, those who are living on or near reservations and the census claimed 360,500. Do both omit off-reservation native people? It's unclear. An additional 20,000 off-reservation, meaning native people who lived outside the borders of a reservation, were reported to have served, which brings the number of native service members in World War II to 44,000. So depending on the numbers you compare, you come up with between six and 12% of their population, which obscures the range of support per tribe too. Some tribes rejected service altogether as an affront to their sovereignty, while others enlisted at a reported 70 or more percent of their eligible population. Complicating the issue more was segregation and the ability of draft boards to make judgments on the race of a service member. Native people in the South were often placed in black units depending on the shade of their skin. So even considering one conflict, we can't target an accurate percentage of the population. It's a fact that the military didn't track native population at all until 1980 or 2000, depending on the branch. And even after they did, it doesn't guarantee accuracy. Any service member choosing two or more races ends up in a different category, mixed race or other, depending on the branch. So it's possible that native service numbers are much higher than recorded. Depending on the war or era, the numbers come from different sources and are categorized differently, so can't be compared accurately. As of 2019, according to the Department of Defense, 
sole choice, in other words, single race, not mixed race, active duty, American Indian and Alaska Native service is about half a percent of their population. And it's impossible to know how mixed Native service numbers impact this number. Pacific Islanders, by comparison, serve uh, the most at 3% of their population, and Black people next at a slightly higher half a percent. So why, you may be asking, am I spending so much time at the beginning of our discussion on this issue? Primarily because the idea that Native people participate more than any other race contributes to the martial stereotypes about Native people that define them as bloodthirsty and particularly skilled at combat, even to a supernatural degree. It also exemplifies the conflict between how the government and dominant society define Native people and, with, and how Native people define themselves, which is a recurring theme throughout, Native, uh, throughout American history. Additionally, some histories written previously about Native American military service tend to focus on demographics, how many people served, how many died, etc. Later, layered on top of that is a tendency to romanticize Native people's military service. We chose not to use the word hero. We chose not to further positive stereotypes that are inspired by warrior traditions, but which ultimately cause harm to Native people. We prioritize putting people first. What we hope we've conveyed in our book, and I hope I can also convey today, is that the history of Indigenous American service in the US military is much more interesting and complicated when we look at the experiences of people instead of generalizations. Though on the surface stereotypes might not seem to directly relate to our discussion, in reality, the perception of American Indian people as fierce warriors has directly affected their experiences in the military. From the first alliances of native nations in the colonial era, through the revolution, civil war and beyond, the perceived ferocity of native people has placed them in positions of danger and risk far more frequently than their non-native compatriots, resulting in native people shouldering a disproportionate number of casualties compared to other ethnicities. In World War II, we could only make an educated guess why some tribes such as the Lakota and Dakota, who together have been called Sioux, the Pawnee and other Plains nations suffered higher casualties than some other native nations. Sioux service members constituted about one fifth of the total native people killed in the war, 100 out of 550. It's not clear whether this is because they were more aggressive or courageous in battle or whether their commanding officers assumed they had martial talents so place them in combat more often. Alison Bernstein, whose book is a foundational work on the topic of native people in World War II, suggests a third factor, that the high mortality rate might be a result of the army's tendency to assign those who were less educated to combat units. Now I'm gonna take you on a quick journey of the Pacific Rim as Alaska, the continental US and the Pacific Islands all experienced very different sides of the war. We'll begin in the territory of Hawaii, where Pacific people have served in the US military since the Civil War, when it was still the Kingdom of Hawaii, with the attack on Pu'uloa, or Pearl Harbor. In talking about Native Hawaiian participation, I'd like to recognize the expertise of Indigenous people in their own waterways, which was a great boon to the Navy and Coast Guard throughout the United States and its territories. Many Native people served in and volunteered for the Coast Guard and its predecessor services, from the Wampanoag people at Gay Head, Massachusetts, to Native Hawaiians. On the morning of December 7th, 1941, radio man Melvin Kealoha Bell was on duty at the Coast Guard radio station at Diamond Head Light when the Japanese attacked. He received direction to transmit a warning to all commercial ships and stations to avoid the area. After the attack, Bell focused on the war effort as a specialist in naval communications intelligence with the Navy's fleet radio unit Pacific or FRUPAC as they broke the Japanese Imperial Navy's codes, thereby contributing to victories in the Pacific theater. While in the Coast Guard, Bell became the first Pacific Islander to become a chief petty officer. And notably, he was the first non-white Coast Guardsman to achieve the rank of Master Chief. <clears throat> 
After 20 years of active duty, he continued another 45 as a civilian Coast Guard employee, finally retiring at age 84 with 65 years of service, one of the longest military careers in US history. In 2019, the Coast Guard named their 55th cutter after him. Elsewhere on Oahu, the high school students at the Kamehameha schools overlooking Pu'uloa responded to the attack. For this information, I'm grateful to Dr. Tai Kavika Tengen, who wrote on this topic for our publication and who has a forthcoming publication on native Hawaiian veterans. So I encourage you to follow his work. The Kamehameha schools were exclusively for native Hawaiian students who, as it happened, were already well prepared to serve. The boys who had been in the junior ROTC were assigned to guard the school's water supply after the attack. And some volunteered for the Hawaii Territorial Guard. The girls who had been trained in nursing assisted patients when their school campus was later declared a wartime hospital. Dr. Tangan reflected on the conflicted feelings held by native Hawaiians about the attack and the war. America's forced annexation of the Hawaiian kingdom in 1898 was in part motivated by the U.S. desire to establish a naval base at Pu'uloa to further U.S. expansion. After annexation, native people experienced cultural and economic suppression by the U.S. government. But like indigenous people in the continental U.S., their love of the, their homeland at least in part motivated their involvement in its defense. Also similar was the post-war environmental, cultural, and political activism by Native Hawaiian people that endures today and which also remain, remains directly related to the presence of the U.S. Navy in Pearl Harbor. On the same day, a Japanese Zero crash-landed on the westernmost Hawaiian island of Ni'ihau, sparking some of the most dramatic events outside Pu'uloa, pitting Japanese and Hawaiian residents of the island against each other. Ultimately, after terrorizing residents in an, in an attempt to retrieve his papers, the Japanese pilot shot native Hawaiian Ben Kanahele, who with his wife Ella, who had been taken hostage, ultimately killed the pilot. For his bravery, Kanahele was awarded two presidential citations, the Purple Heart and the Medal of Merit. Next, I'll take you to the far north. Over the course of the war, more than 6,300 Alaska natives from 107 communities volunteered to serve in the Alaska Territorial Guard, also called the Eskimo Scouts, assembled to defend Alaska's 6,640 6, mile coastline against the potential of Japanese invasion. Men and women from children to elders participated in the ATG. Again, the indigenous expertise in their own homelands played a key role in the country's defense. Alaska Native people had generations of knowledge of the terrain and weather, and as subsistence hunters, both men and women were already expert shooters. About 27 women were ATG members. In June 1942, the Japanese invaded the U.S. territory of Alaska, bombing the Army and Navy installations at Dutch Harbor and occupying the Aleutian Islands of Attu and Kiska. After the residents of Attu were taken prisoner to Japan, the U.S. evacuated the remaining Aleut people, allegedly for their well-being. As they left, the government burned their villages to prevent them from being an asset to the enemy. Displaced families were transported to southeastern Alaska, where they were resettled for the next three years in fish canneries, abandoned mine buildings, and other substandard spaces. Approximately 100 of the 881 uh, interned ec evacuees died by the, war the war's end. As Paul Ungatuk, professor and son and grandson of ATG members wrote in our publication, many non-native people viewed the military training of Alaska natives with concern. Racism against indigenous Alaskans was widespread. Native people were paid half that of non-natives. Some areas of major towns like Juneau and Anchorage were restricted to white people only. So the prospect of arming those who were being subjugated brought about fears of ret retribution, yet no retribution occurred. <laughs> 
the ATG patrolled borders, spotting and shooting down Japanese incendiary balloon bombs that traveled the jet stream, jet stream and ignited forest fires on impact. To reduce public panic, many of these uh, operations were classified. Native Alaskan service motivated social change during and after the war. They advocated for racial integration within the US military and returning service members organized and advocated for Alaska Native rights and desegregation, persuading the territorial government to approve Alaska's first anti-discrimination law. ATG members were finally granted official veteran status in 2000. Though Aleut men mainly entered the services after the U.S. government's evacuation of the Aleut villages in 1942, some enlisted early in the regular army, like Private Simeon Pletnikov here, seen here, bound for Atu. Pletnikov was reportedly the most decorated army soldier in the Aleutian campaign. He recalled of his time on Atu, I had a heck of a time out on the front line the Americans would get a hold of me and want to kill me and all that. They tried to take me to the provost marshal for impersonating a US soldier. What's the matter with you guys? I'm an Aleut. Native service members frequently reported being mistaken for the enemy and Pletnikov is a good example. Dr. William Meadows, whose expertise on code talkers and Kiowa, Comanche and Apache warrior societies we have leaned heavily on his work for our publication, has a forthcoming book on the pattern of mistaken identity for native people in war. Not just World War II, but Korea, Vietnam to today. Meadows has identified 27 cases of mistaken identity for Navajo code talkers alone and more among other native service members. Why is this significant? Being reminded of their similarity to the enemy whether in appearance or political situation, as a war-torn nation, often created empathy and reflection. Why am I fighting for a country that oppresses my people? Am I oppressing others on behalf of that country? What rights will I have once I return home? Though we might immediately leap to blame racism as to why mistaken identity happened during wartime, the issue is more complex. According to Dr. Meadows, during World War II, as well as Korea and Vietnam, groups that had previously not had contact were thrown together in a highly charged situation. In all of these conflicts, both allies and enemies were known to impersonate each other to infiltrate and gain information. There are documented instances in World War II where white Americans who had never been around American Indians, Asians, or Latina people could not tell them apart. Some American Indians reported that they couldn't always differentiate either. Groups came together during war who had never before been in close contact. In the heat of the moment, service members had to make judgments quickly. A brief story from Dr. Meadows before we move on as we had a, a lively email exchange about this topic. He says, after capturing him on Bataan, the Japanese mistook Joe Kayumiya, who was Navajo, as Japanese American and beat him until he made it clear that he was American Indian. They later forced him to try and break the Navajo code, but he couldn't. He was captured before the code was formed, had no knowledge of it, and even though he was a fluent Navajo speaker, it was gibberish to him. He also said, uh, Dr. Meadows also said, that while there are racial aspects to how the wars are fought, especially in the Pacific during World War II, once individuals suspected of being Japanese were identified as American Indian, there was no subsequent disdain of any kind and documented cases where the white Americans even befriended those mistaken point, points towards misidentification rather than intentional racism. Dr. Meadows upcoming book, Navajo Code Talkers and Ethnic Misidentification in World War II um, might be something you all are, might want to look out for, I, I know I am. Perhaps the most significant and unique contribution made by Native Americans in World War II was the use of their languages in, created, in creating coded messages that were never broken by the enemy. Though many have heard about the Navajo code talkers, more than two dozen languages were ultimately used in communications during World War II. 
there were two types of code talking. Type one, wherein the military specifically recruited language speakers to create codes within their language. And type two, which was the incidental or happenstance use of native languages to, to transmit messages, but without the additional layer of code. Perhaps the greatest irony of this successful program was that the federal government, often along with the Christian church, had spent the previous 50 or so years forcibly taking generations of native children away from their homes to erase their culture and languages in mostly off-reservation boarding schools. These photos are of two different schools on the Navajo reservation, 40 years apart. Uh, the one on the left is a federal boarding school and the later uh, in 1940 is a day school. So clearly languages and cultures still endure despite aggressive attempts to eradicate and westernize indigenous people and their cultures. During the Pacific War, only Hopi and Navajo languages were used for type one code, but other languages were used in communications, including Pawnee, Assiniboine, Lakota and Dakota, which were used throughout the Pacific, and Muscogee Creek and Seminole, used during the Aleutian campaign. The Marine Corps recruited Navajo men for the largest code talking program of the war, which ultimately trained 420 code talkers who were spread across the Pacific. According to Dr. Meadows, the Marines placed about 38 to 40 code talkers per division. The Navajo program was the only one classified, though not very well, as the military itself wrote news articles about their successful communications program, both during and after the war. The large size of the Navajo program has garnered them more publicity in recent years, but approximately 260 or more additional speakers of about two dozen native languages participated in World War II, either as type one or type two code talkers. I mainly wanted to show this photo because I really like how it demonstrates the diversity of tribes. So here's a, a handful of people, native uh, soldiers standing with uh, General MacArthur, and they are Pima or also called Akimel Otham from the Southwest in Arizona, Pawnee from Oklahoma, the Southern Plains, Chitimacha from Louisiana, and Diné or Navajo from also from the Southwest. So diversity of tribes. I'd like to briefly mention some other notable members of the service in the Pacific before we discuss the broader impact. Major General Clarence Tinker was the first Native American in United States Army history to attain the rank of Major General and the first US General to die in World War II. He was an Osage citizen from Pawhuska, Oklahoma and was educated at Indian boarding schools before joining the US Army. Uh, be, he became an accomplished flyer in the Army Air Service with extensive knowledge of aerial pursuit and bombardment. After the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, General Tinker was given command of the Army Air Forces stationed in Hawaii. Appro approximately 75% of the planes on the airfields surrounding Pearl Harbor were damaged or destroyed, and more than 200 Army Air Forces personnel were killed. Tinker set out to train camp, uh, combat crews and repair and modify damaged aircraft, getting airmen and their planes into battle readiness. When the Japanese began their massive June 1940 attack on Midway Island, Tinker elected to lead one of several high-level bomber attacks on the Japanese fleet. The aircraft was last seen falling out of formation, disappearing into the clouds below, and crashed into the sea killing everybody on board. Tinker Air Force Base in Oklahoma is named after him. An Akamel Otham citizen, Ira Hayes, is arguably the most famous Native American service member of World War II, known because of his role in raising the second American flag over the island of Iwo Jima, the one photographed by Joe Rosenthal and which became immortalized in the Marine Corps War Memorial outside Arlington National Cemetery. Though Hayes made many public appearances in celebration of his participation in the flag raising, he wasn't comfortable in the spotlight. He attempted to live a private life at home in Sacaton, Arizona, uh, 
but unfortunately died at age 33. Many people struggled to adapt to their previous life after returning from home from World War II. They were returning to a home, a society, and a culture that had undergone change. An estimated 44,000 American Indian people left their reservations for cities to seek jobs in 1944 alone. In 1940, fewer than 5% of Native people lived in cities. By 1950, that rose to 20%. Though movement from the reservation was assumed by the government to usher in a new era of assimilation, many still retained ties to their homelands. The diaspora caused both labor scarcity and also opportunities on the reservation. During the war, women, as they did in other parts of the nation, took up jobs previously held by men. About 800 women were accepted into the Women's Army Corps and the WAVES, or Women Accepted for Volunteer Emergency Service, a Naval Reserve. Some served for the duration of the war, and others made it a career, including Grace Thorpe, who was a recruiter in the Women's Army Corps, then was on MacArthur's staff in Japan as the chief of the recruitment section. Like many returning veterans, Thorpe became an activist and advocate for Native American rights, working for the National Congress of American Indians, joining the occupation of Alcatraz as their publicity manager, serving as a legislative assistant with the Senate Subcommittee for Indian Affairs, among other of her accomplishments. She returned to her home in Oklahoma and served as a tribal district court judge and activist against storing nuclear waste on tribal lands. In 2015, her family donated her papers, photographs, and medals to the National Museum of the American Indian. And as in other parts of the country, women left on the reservation took over for their ab absent men in addition to household farming and livestock care. Pueblo women in the Southwest took mechanic training and drove trucks hauling freight around the region. Native people, civilians and, and military service members were adopting wage work in some cases for the first time. New industries had arisen on reservations in the veterans' absence. In Hoopa, in Northern California, for example, veterans returning expected to resume a farming lifestyle only to find a booming lumber business that had emerged during the war, which provided stable jobs. Service members returned home with a new social awareness where they had previously been isolated both physically and culturally. Working alongside non-Native people and being treated as somewhat equal was empowering for many. The return home and influx of Western culture also had a downside, forcing tribes to adapt or reject change. Not all Native communities welcomed change and saw returning veterans and their adaptations to mainstream American society as a threat. Zuni Pueblo in New Mexico, for example, required veterans to go through a cleansing ritual after returning from war, which by the way was extremely common uh, traditionally to welcome and ease veterans return and re-entry into the community. Then the tribe proposed uh, opposed the Western social influences such as wearing suits and uniforms and opposed establishing an American Legion post actions that alienated veterans to the extent that one third of them chose to leave the reservation by 1947. Though their return often represented innovation and assimilation with its pros and cons, depending on the cultural customs, the ability of more native people to now advocate on their own terms, such as visiting Washington DC in suits and presenting cases in English rather than being exoticized and patronized for their language and regalia as in the, in the past was powerful. And they began to advocate for rights that they felt that they had earned, such as the right to vote, as well as ones that they retained as outlined in their treaties. Instead of advocating only in terms of their individual tribes and concerns, which historically were fairly decentralized, native people increasingly recognized their commonalities and the power of working together across tribal lines for the mutual benefit of all Native people. Beginning with children from different tribes who attended boarding schools together, 
and further catalyzed by veterans returning from World War II, the Pan-Indian movement became a powerful reworking of how American Indians responded to the United States government and society. Organizations emerged such as the National Congress of American Indians, which was founded in 1944 to resist government attempts to terminate tribal sovereignty, and the American Indian Movement, or AIM, an activist organization that was founded in 1968 in Minneapolis to advocate for tribal sovereignty and treaty rights, as well as the civil rights of urban native populations. The takeaway of the post-war era for Native people is not that they embraced assimilation, nor did most Native people reject all of Western culture either. Native veterans, like those in past wars, identified how their newly gained knowledge could work for them on individual and community levels. Also as in the past, the federal government's gold, goals for Native people differed for, from Native people's goals for themselves. While Native people sought acknowledgement and recognition for their way of life, the United States considered the success of American Indians' wartime participation as a sign that their assimilation campaigns had been a success and that Indians had lived up to the expectations of U.S. citizenship. As a result, the House passed concurrent resolution, resolution 108, better known as termination, a resolution allowing for tribes, trust status, treaties, and all federal responsibility due to Indian tribes to be terminated. This would be the dominating policy for the next 20 years and was strongly opposed by most Native nations, not because they wanted to rely on the federal government, which is a common misperception, but because the ability to remain sovereign nations with the right to determine their way of life has always been one of the main ideals held by Indigenous nations. Treaties, regardless of their convoluted history, recognize their inherent rights to their lands and affirm their right to self-government. The pre-war policies put forth by the Commissioner of Indian Affairs, John Collier, in contrast to the later termination era, had affirmed Native nation sovereignty and began to steer the government away from prior policies designed to civilize, quote, civilize Indian people, such as through boarding schools. Though, through Collier's Indian New Deal in 1934, the government supported and promoted native arts and governance. Ultimately, the first half of the 20th century saw sweeping changes in policy towards native peoples that went back and forth, variably attempting to destroy and affirm native nations and cultures. American Indian participation in the world wars sparked movement towards citizenship and suffrage but many of the central issues endured by Native people and their veterans at that time are still fought for today. Voting access, treaty rights, environmental protection, culture and language re retention, and self-governance. I wanna thank you for joining me. I've included some additional resources here for you in case you'd like to explore these topics on a deeper level. Thank you again.